A few years ago, me and a friend were getting pretty sick of the New England weather. We get our fair share of sunshine up here, but only for about three weeks out of 52. So after one particularly washout summer where the sky barely shifted from its regular gray tone, we decided on a road trip to alleviate the rain-soaked misery. We didn't have a destination in mind as such, just a direction, south. As far south as we could possibly go without having to buy ourselves a Spanish phrase book. About a fortnight in, we'd made it all the way down to New Mexico. I'd enjoyed the BBQ in South Carolina, relished the peach cobbler in Georgia, but nothing compared to the food in New Mexico. I thought I'd be eating good Mexican food back home, but I came to realize I'd been eating lies. Turns out the closer you get to the border, the better the food gets. Mexican food isn't all about spice either, although that is a big part of it, but even then it's not that bear mace kind of burning hot that we might associate with it. There's tangy, fruity salsa made from pineapples, not to mention the smoky flavor that ancho chili imparts to dishes, but I digress. We'd been so charmed by New Mexico that instead of rolling through it into Arizona like we planned, we decided to tour a little more of the state before leaving. This meant we rolled down dusty roads, visiting little cowboy towns and antajito joints along the way. So at one point, we are still a few hundred miles away from our planned stop and we're getting pretty tired. Driving at night can be disorienting and dangerous, so instead of just switching over while the driver sleeps in the back seat, we decided to just pull over and sleep a few hours until dawn before we get back on the road. The only problem was finding somewhere safe enough to park up. Now, when I picture New Mexico, I picture the kinds of adobe brown desert scenes made famous by old westerns. But as it turns out, New Mexico has its fair share of snow-capped mountains and lush green forests. We happened to be driving by one such patch of tall pines when we called our rest stop. So we pull in and turn down a dirt road and wind it among the trees. We're taking it slow, trying to find a turnoff or campground to park up at to get some shut-eye. It took a while, but we found one, parking up and turning off the engine before unpacking our sleeping gear and leaning back the seats. As you can imagine, though, New Mexico gets real warm and stays real warm well into the night. So although it'd leave us prey to the mosquitoes, cracking the window to allow some much-needed fresh air in was absolutely essential. It was actually kind of nice for a while lying there, drifting off with the sound of crickets chirping and coyotes yipping in the hills. It was relaxing listening to the sounds of nature, until I heard a sound that was distinctly unrelaxing, the sound of hushed human voices. My eyes open in the darkness as I strain to hear just what these voices are saying, but I can't make out anything specific, just that at least two people are talking amongst themselves in hushed tones. This is a big red flag for me. Sometimes you get people walking past your car when you're trying to sleep, mostly in cities, but sometimes out in the sticks too. If they're loud, it generally means they're just drunk and headed home. Sure, drunk can be another kind of red flag for danger, but not nearly as much as actual hushed voices. Whispers mean a person doesn't want to be heard. Whispers mean someone is up to no good. Although we're from a state where legislation has made firearm ownership pretty much next to impossible, we weren't about to roll down the deep south without proper protection. Not so much from the people. All our interactions with people in the southern states were overwhelmingly positive, but there's no reasoning with a bear or a rattlesnake. So we stopped at the first gun show we found in West Virginia to pick up something small but powerful, a forty four snub nose revolver. The moment I heard those hushed, whispering voices, I popped the glove compartment and took it out. After I made sure it was loaded, I leaned over to my buddy and gently shook him awake. Huh? What? What time is it? His eyes were bloodshot, his voice croaky. Listen to me. The fear in my voice had him paying attention. There's someone outside. We talked it over countless times what we'd do if someone tried to rob or kidnap us. What was at first a morbid mental exercise had suddenly become all too real. 
We decided to get out and confront whoever was out there, hoping they'd hear that we are armed, get scared, and take off. It could have just been a few kids hanging around drinking, but it's always better to be safe than sorry. So we get out, me with the flashlight in one hand, the revolver in the other. We're both shining flashlights into the trees, but seeing nothing. We haven't heard any voices since we got out of the car, and I'm hoping they've just moved on. But like I said, better safe than sorry. Hey, anyone there? My buddy calls out into the darkness. We give a minute or so and no one replies. But that doesn't mean we're feeling safe and sound, so we start walking into the trees, trying to find whoever was whispering. I'm expecting to find a handful of thugs who were going to rob us of our car and wallets, but what we found was much, much worse. The thing that hit me first was the smell. The further we got into the trees, the stronger the sickly sweet smell of hot garbage seemed to be. Neither of us had ever smelled anything like it in our lives, so it wasn't like we had anything to compare it to. It wasn't like we recognized it or anything. Then we saw the pit, the shadow of the ground opening up before us. Then we saw the shovels, the plastic sheets stained with something brownish red. Flies were buzzing around the open pit, so loud I could barely hear my own voice when I exclaimed in pure horror at what lay at the bottom. It was a body, a human body, only it was barely recognizable as one. It had been beaten so badly it looked like a monster, a hideous imitation of the human form. The face was swollen, bloodied and bruised, eyelids swollen shut as huge busted lips still leaked gore onto the neck and chin. We ran, got into our car, and got out of there. What followed was probably the most terrifying few minutes of my life. I expected to see another vehicle's lights appear on the road behind us, getting bigger as they got closer, chasing us down to silence us forever. But they didn't. Nothing happened. The adrenaline had us so wired that we drove all night to the next town, calling in at a local sheriff's department as soon as we arrived. We didn't stay long in that area, so naturally we didn't hear back from the cops regarding what happened to the body or if they found the guys trying to bury it. But I still think about it every now and then, and what that poor person could have possibly done to deserve to die in such a way. Me and my friends are grunge freaks. We started out on Nirvana and Soundgarden, eventually discovering more obscure bands like Mudhoney, The Melvins, and The Screaming Trees. Anyone who knows anything about grunge will tell you that it all started in Seattle. How this spontaneous new genre sprang out of the ashes of post-punk to take the world by storm, and it all happened within like a few square miles. So naturally, Seattle was like a mecca for grunge fans, and after years of planning and false commitment, we finally got our stuff together and went on a road trip to our sacred city. That's how we ended up on the Wyoming interstate. So we're just driving along, singing along to Alice in Chains songs when the next thing I know, I can see red and blue flashes in my rear view. My buddies in the back seat spin around, seeing the same thing I did. An unmarked vehicle with one of those attachable emergency lights on the top. As I start to pull over... I'm wondering where this cop car came from. We were on this long stretch of open road and could see for miles around us. It was pretty unnerving that it had managed to just creep up on us like that. But you know how it is. Traffic cops tend to stay out of sight in little rest areas or whatever. Their speedometers at the ready. Now I was well within the speed limit, but I was still worried. I'd be lying if I said we didn't have anything on us that we shouldn't have but that was all buried in our bags in the trunk, and even then it wasn't exactly enough to charge us with. So I just got my driver's license ready on my lap and kept my hands at ten and two like a good little citizen. The cop turns off his lights and then gets out of the unmarked car, walking along the dusty road towards us. He's wearing civilian clothes, a baseball cap, 
aviator's sunglasses and checkered shirt, but I can clearly see the utility belt and badge he's wearing. When he knocks on my window, I promptly roll it down, smiling while I give him my cheeriest, Good afternoon, officer. I'm no bootlicker, but I'm not going to give this guy an excuse to ruin our road trip. What follows probably isn't exactly what was said that day, but it's as best as I can remember. Afternoon, officer. Uh, how can I help you? Driver's license and registration, he demands curtly. Sure thing. I take one hand off the steering wheel and hand him my license. He takes a long, careful look, first at my license, then at me. Detroit, huh? He finally said dismissively. You're a long way from home, son. What's your business in Wyoming? Uh, we're actually on a road trip, sir. Headed out towards Washington, Seattle to be specific. What for? Uh, just because, I, I guess, always wanted to see the West Coast. Just because. The cop mockingly interjected. Uh, maybe see some of, uh, California. My words broke off. I really didn't like where the whole thing was going. Any weapons in the car? No, sir. Drugs or alcohol? No, sir. I replied without hesitation. But the answer didn't satisfy him. I could feel his steely gaze from behind his mirrored sunglasses. They made him seem like more of a machine than a man. I'm going to need y'all to step out of the vehicle. His voice was cold. What, what for? Don't make me tell you again, son. I turned to my buddies in the back seat. They looked as worried as I felt. Slowly, we did as we were told and got out of my car, walking over to the side of the road and grouping together near the verge. It was then that I actually got a good look at the unmarked car the cop was driving. It was an old Dodge pickup. I mean really old. It looked like it might fall apart if the thing drove faster than 40. Something interesting you about my vehicle, son? Uh, n no sir. I lied, thinking that the department must have been seriously underfunded. The nice front. One of my buddies shot me a look as if to say, what is this guy's deal? But I just shook my head. Figuring if we just played along, we'd get out of there faster. I'm going to need to see the passenger's IDs, the cop said suddenly. Uh, mine's in the car, my one friend said. The other said the same. You didn't take out IDs to show a cop at a traffic stop? Are you mentally disabled? I, I uh, no. Then go, get him, pair you. Few more nervous looks amongst us before they start wandering back to the car to get their IDs. Then, to my complete shock, the cop takes his revolver out of his holster hip, flicks off the safety, and points it towards my buddies. One of my friends turns, looks down the barrel of the revolver, and freezes in place, pure fear in his eyes. I'm not going to shoot you, but I need to cover myself just in case you pull a pistol out of that back seat. The cop said with a grin. Go on. Go get him. It was about this point that I decided to make a formal complaint against the cop. I was scared, sure, but I was also really angry, too. Whatever backwater county this was, their volunteer sheriff program obviously needed some thorough vetting. I didn't know how much good it would do, but I had to do something. This idiot had to pay. After he gets my buddy's ID, he takes them back to his truck and starts writing stuff down on a notepad, obviously all our personal information. Then he starts talking to someone, but not on a radio as you'd expect. All he had was a cell phone in his hand. When he finishes, he gets out then doesn't even walk all the way over to us before just tossing our IDs in the dirt. Go on. Get out of Wyoming. He spat before getting back into his truck and speeding off into the distance, leaving us choking on a cloud of dirt. Once he's out of sight, we start cursing him out, 
raging about how we're going to make a formal complaint once we're back home from our trip. Now, cut to about an hour later and we're only about 50 miles further into our journey when another set of red and blue lights appear in my rear view. We just straight up panic at this point and actually debate whether or not to try to outrun this psycho since there's no way his old truck could keep up. But once we work out that it's an actual marked unit this time, and evidently not some idiot, we pull over and repeat the entire process. Only, it doesn't go quite the same way. I'll just tell you what you need to know. At some point I mentioned to this uniform cop that I've already been stopped like just an hour before. He looks confused and asks where we've been pulled over. I didn't know any place names by heart, but I insisted it was less than a hundred miles back the way we came. When the uniform cop tells us that that's impossible, it takes all my will not to ask the guy if all Wyoming cops are as incompetent as this. But then he finishes his sentence. I'm the only highway patrol in the county right now. If it wasn't me who pulled you over, I really don't know who did. We described the guy who pulled us over to the uniform cop, told him the vehicle type, even the color of this idiot's mustache, but the cop has no clue who we were talking about. Then it hits us. The guy wasn't highway patrol. He wasn't even a volunteer deputy. To this day, we have no idea who it was that pulled us over on that stretch of interstate. Our complaints to the state police went nowhere, as far as I know. They never found the guy to charge him with impersonating an officer. The lesson being, even though it might make them mad, always ask for ID from cops who pull you over, and be sure to take a darn good look at it. There's some real psychos out there. Many years ago now, my family and I were on a road trip, going to visit Big Bend National Park down in Texas. This was way before the World Wide Web, mind you. That's important for you to know, and you'll know why in a moment. We were trying to plan where to stay, having picked up several brochures for actual ranch stays in the area at the time. There were only about three or four to begin with. We narrowed them down to two, which appeared to list the very same things horseback riding. It's important to note here that when we made reservations, we verified that the horses would be available during our visit when we called. Swimming, rooms with air conditioning, etc. We wanted horseback riding, and there were only about two that actually offered it. One was $10 cheaper than the other one. The cheaper one, we assumed, was cheaper because it was further out in the country than the other one, which was right in the middle of town. We kind of liked the idea of the quiet desert. Neither brochure had any pictures, so we could only guess about this. Oh my, how we wish we had seen pictures. But first, you know how we selected it because it was further out of town? We had to take a coarsely graveled road to get to the ranch. The road was about 18 miles long, and we got an actual flat, and not just any flat. We blew a huge hole in the tire. Sure, we had a spare, but the point is, is that we're in the middle of the Texas desert with very little water, and it's fast approaching midday. It's actually really dangerous to be out there since you can develop heat stroke literally within about 20 minutes of being exposed to that kind of heat. The size of the hole in the tire meant that a patch was impossible. We also didn't know any numbers for local mechanics, so we're kind of panicking when this other truck comes rolling along. He eyes us up and down, seeing that we're city folk, and you can tell straight away he is nothing but contempt for us. He starts telling us all about how dangerous it is to be stuck out here in the desert, how quickly rattlesnake venom can kill you dead, how the vultures pick clean the bones of anything that falls victim to the elements out there. That's if the bandits or smugglers didn't find us first. The local guys sold us a new tire for... Are you ready for this? $150. Yep. Keep in mind that this was about 25 years ago, so imagine how much that would be now. And it wasn't like we couldn't not buy it. 
We had no choice. It was literally buy the tire or face the consequences. So we paid for the tire and went on our way. When we arrived, we gaped in horror at the scene before us. The place we chose, this cheaper one, wasn't a hotel ranch at all. They were actually trailers sitting on a rocky hill. I kid you not. I'm talking mobile homes lifted and sitting on tons of rocks on hills. Sure, they were weighted down and there was a graded edge, but you had to actually climb the rocks to get to the trailer or cabin. Rocks, and you had to carefully ascend them. How a place like this ever got a business license nor have a lawsuit filed against them is beyond me. I guess in those days, I suppose, people weren't as sue happy as they are now. Though I do remember it was getting started good, but I digress. When we checked in, in the dining room, we were informed that the horses were not out for the summer yet, and this was in May, in South Texas, where it's summer nearly all year round. This, after we had been told that they would definitely be available on that date. Fine. We ate our dinner in the dining room, which was at the bottom of the Rock Hill, we went to make our way up the hill to the trailer and my foot slipped on a rock and the next thing I knew I was falling off the rocks. My ankle was sprained. Now how in the heck I was supposed to finish climbing up there to get to the room? For that matter, how would I ever go back and forth? So we finally get to the room and I elevate my foot on the bed. I'm hot, I'm tired, and I just want to sit for a few minutes, thanking God that at least this bad day is nearly over. I turn on the TV, hoping to find something relaxing to watch. We were told that the cabins had satellite TV, which was just getting started good. Unfortunately, we could only pick one channel. Was it any surprise, then, that the one channel we got was only in Japanese? Are you kidding me? This was the Texas desert. I could see Spanish, but Japanese? I showed my teenage son, but he said it wasn't Japanese text. It was a language he'd never seen before, and he's really into Asian cartoons and whatnot. The shower was completely broken. It only drizzled water, and that water was scorching hot. Not useful at all. We weren't able to take a shower while we were there, and believe me, we needed to. Later, we joked about it, saying that we felt like we were in Chevy Chase's National Lampoon's vacation movie, when nothing goes right. It's funny now, though obviously it wasn't back then. It is those kind of trips that create truly vivid memories. But the first night, we hardly slept. There were weird noises of things moving outside the mobile homes. Things sniffing and scratching in the dirt outside. It was horrible. We told ourselves it was just coyotes, but I know coyotes and they don't make those noises. The next morning, my husband took a walk in the fields around us. When he got back, he told us to pack our bags... The horses weren't missing at all. They were all in a field about a mile out from our mobile homes, all laying in a field, flies buzzing around where their corpses lay. As we left for the Big Bend area, we decided to stop in at the other ranch we had considered. It was nauseating to discover that that place was perfect. The bedrooms were authentic looking, the beds were old Texas-style beds, the kind that are a large box with a mattress on it, the horses were out front, the TV worked and had HBO. They had an amazing shower room and the dining room had ceiling fans. Oh my, what a mistake we had made. It would only have been an extra $10. Needless to say, the lesson we learned was to never, ever book a stay anywhere without first seeing pictures. That seems like duh advice for today, but back then there wasn't much we could do about it. In any case, it was definitely an adventure. A few years back, my friends and I decided to see the country. We'd grown up around Sacramento area, and as much as we loved our native Cali, we knew well that the Lower West Coast is hardly a decent representation of the United States. Apparently, there's a huge stretch of land between the coasts called America, or at least that's what some would have you believe. 
but either way, I didn't want to go off to college and into full-time work without having a story or two to tell my dorm mates. So, cut to about three days into the journey. We're on our way to our first real stop in Boise, Idaho. My buddies hooked his iPhone up to the minivan speakers via an auxiliary cable and is in the process of playing every single road trip related song he could possibly find. I might have been annoyed if his music taste wasn't so good. Keep your eyes on the road and your hands upon the wheel, we all roared along with Jim Morrison, Roadhouse Blues blasting so loud I could barely hear the van's engine. It was so much fun. We dreamed of the ultimate road trip and now we were actually living it. Didn't even need a beer to feel the buzz of it. Just a few miles outside of Boise, we see someone standing by the side of the road in the distance. It's important to remember the frame of mind we're in, romanticizing the road. We were all Jack Kerouac that day. I mean, I never normally stop for a hitchhiker. I've always watched way too many horror films. But since there was four of us packed into that van, a kind of collective bravado had taken over us. So as we pass the dude and see he actually has his thumb out, we collectively flip. I stop the van in the middle of the road and slowly start reversing up towards where this guy stood. Need a ride, dude? He instantly looked elated. He'd obviously had no luck for a few good hours and a van full of teenagers was like a godsend to him. I could kind of see why people might pass him. He looked a little rough with this weird kind of young old vibe going on. Like his clothes were fairly modern, but his skin was leathery as all get out. Like he'd spent all day underneath Utah or Nevada sun. Y'all going to Boise? He asked in a gravelly voice. Sure are, dude. Hop in. So the guy tells us his name is Jimmy, and that he's actually from Idaho originally, but has spent a lot of time out of state for work. We ask him what he does for a living, and he gave us some weird answer about being a contractor. Said his last job was really constrictive, and he was really happy to get away from it, and was just heading back into Boise to see some old friends. He starts telling us stories from time to time on the road, and it sounded like he was something of a wild child in the early 80s. How he went to California looking for work and ended up getting in a few scrapes with the law. At one point, one of my buddies asked Jimmy if he'd spent any time inside. I really don't know what he expected the answer to be, but all of a sudden, Jimmy's tone changes completely as he shoots my friend a daggered look. No, and I don't ever intend to, he replied contemptuously. The atmosphere in the van shifted. It was super awkward for a few miles, but the conversation soon returned to normal with us swapping stories and sharing laughs. After about an hour or so of continuous driving, we were getting closer and closer to Boise, but it was around then that we hit our first serious speed bump. I look in the rearview mirror and see an Idaho State Police Cruiser. As it's speeding up behind us, I move over a little to let it pass, only it doesn't. Then, Jimmy saw the cop car and ducks down in the seat. We start laughing and joking about him being a fugitive or something, only he doesn't join in. He just stays down in the seat and doesn't make a sound. As soon as the cop car's lights turn on and the siren blared across the highway, I knew what was about to happen. It was like I could see the whole thing pan out in my head in slow motion, and I was powerless to do anything to stop it. It was far too late for that. I actually started slowing down to pull over purely wishful thinking on my part. I expected to hear Jimmy say something, and I was right. Only it wasn't him that spoke first. What? You have a gun? One of my buddies cries. You keep this thing moving. Don't stop for nothing. I hear him cock the hammer on his weapon. I didn't even turn around to see what it was. You slow this van down and I'ma shoot every single one of you, you hear? I've never been so scared in my entire life. I could hear the cop shouting over his loudspeaker. Driver, pull the vehicle over to the side of the road right now. But I couldn't. We were trapped. It was only about then that I checked the fuel gauge out of habit. It turned out to be a godsend. 
In our foolish revelry, we'd passed numerous gas stations we really should have stopped at to refuel. Now we only had a few miles worth of gas. All we'd have to do was wait for it to run out. I remember feigning a kind of solidarity with the guy, assuring him I wouldn't pull over until we'd passed state lines on the other side of Boise. My buddies must have thought I was nuts, but they didn't know what I did. They didn't know that all we had to do was run the clock out. Oh, we're running out of gas. Oh, sorry, dude, I'm going to have to pull over. Your best chance is to just jump out and run. Just run and never look back. Jimmy ate it up. It was an Oscar-winning performance, if I do say so myself. He actually pat me on the shoulder as I slowed the van down and edged over to the roadside. You're a good kid. You'll do all right, he said. I remember his breath smelling rotten. When I finally pull the car over, one of my buddies slides the van door open and Jimmy hauls it into the trees. One of the cops jumps out, securing us in the van while his partner got this big dog from the backseat of their cruiser and chased the guy through the woods. We were there for an hour or two while the cops searched our van, but we didn't have anything illegal on us. Thank God we finished all the beer we'd managed to wrangle the night before, or we might have actually had something to worry about. Once it was established that the guy was basically holding us hostage, they let us go, and one of the cops actually tells me I did the right thing. They didn't catch him, and as far as I know, they never have. But whatever the case, I know Jimmy can't have been the dude's real name. No one was hurt, nothing was damaged, but still, I have zero intention of ever picking up a hitchhiker again. What follows is the story of the most terrible night of my entire life so far. I haven't told anyone this story online before and only a handful of my friends and family even know this actually happened. I will try to tell it as best as I can, but if I'm honest, my hands are trembling as I try to recall the events of that night. We live in Delhi, India, and it was our first ever road trip which we planned to drive down to Kolkata. We booked a rental vehicle from a company called Zoomcar, which came with a few problems as the staff on duty didn't seem to know anything about the booking. But eventually, after some complaining, we managed to convince them to rush through some paperwork, with a bribe, and they got us the rental license. Anyhow, we managed to actually get our vehicle without much time wasted, and we were very excited to finally be on the way to Kolkata, about 60 kilometers away from Howrah, which is a suburb of Kolkata. At about 9 that evening, we acquired the necessary things, which was obviously cigarettes and beers that we purchased from a local bottle shop, then would drink them on the way to save some time. We stopped briefly to have our dinners at a roadside restaurant, then carried onward towards Kolkata. A few hours later, closer to midnight, we're rolling along this big Indian highway listening to that Avicii song, I Took a Pill in Ibiza. We were in the car, smoking cigs and listening to the songs. Our playlist was fantastic because everyone was a music lover. There were eight of us in total, so it was quite the ruckus inside the van. I was sitting in the middle seat at the window behind the driver's seat. I lit a cigarette and I was feeling incredibly relaxed. I had cracked the window and the cool breeze was touching my face. I was playing songs and was just scrolling Instagram feeds. Everyone was enjoying. It was raining slowly from the evening, but... Around 1.30 a.m., it started to rain very, very heavily with a few lightning flashes in the distance. We were driving right into a thunderstorm, and I'd be lying if I'd said that didn't make me very nervous. Closer to 2 a.m., we closed the windows in the car at a speed of about 80 kilometers per hour. It was still raining very heavily. The roads ahead of us were filled with water, and at that speed, the water was splashing on the windshield. I became a little uncomfortable because it was obvious that it was not safe to be driving at these speeds in those conditions, but honestly, the beers had numbed my better judgments. I wish I could have told him to stop the car, I wish I could have shouted, yelled at him, but I was silent, numb like I was waiting for the accident to happen. I was not open with my insecurities, I buried my fear to look cool and calm, 
I could have done many things. Always be open with your insecurities. My friend, whom I trusted the most with the driving, had taken a break from the wheel and was enjoying a few beers in the back seat. He told the friend who was driving to slow down given the slippery conditions, but the one who was driving was enjoying the speed and didn't intend to slow down. We got on a bridge, and the bridge was almost in total darkness. The car was at a high speed. The water was splashing on the car. We were astounded. I was frightened to see the darkness and the speed of the car in that heavy rain, but then I tried to look calm, chain-smoking cigarettes to keep from having an anxiety attack. I wasn't drunk anymore. The fear was sobering me up. I was kind of tensed and bad thoughts were occurring in my mind. On that bridge, all the good feelings were replaced into bad ones. It must have been almost 2.30 in the morning when we got onto the bridge. In a matter of seconds, the car drifted left, and the one who was driving couldn't control it. My friend shouted from the back, What have you done, Ankit? The car smashed through the metal fence at the side of the road and fell into a deep pond. For some minutes, I was rendered unconscious but the water level soon stabilized and we looked for the first chance to get to safety. The one who was sitting in the front next to the driver's seat broke the windshield as it was already cracked. We got out and we were drenched in water. I took my phone as it was my phone playing the song, Rich Love by One Republic. Everybody else's phone was nowhere to be found. Nobody was hurt except three of us, three of us including me. I was bleeding in the rain and my light t-shirt was drenched with blood. I was bleeding from my ears and fingers of my right hands. I couldn't stop the bleeding simultaneously. The one who was driving got hurt in the legs from the accelerator and the one who was sitting next to him got hurt in the ears and nose. I got myself out from that pond taking the support of my friends and the wrecked car. My friends managed to recover two phones one of which was useless and the other survived because it was an iPhone 7 which acted as a savior to call in emergency services. When we left for the hospital, I was feeling cold from blood loss and the EMT provided me a towel soaked in water to stop the blood which was pouring out from the ear. We called other friends to wait for us near the hospital in Bawanipur. I got seven stitches in my ears and my friend who was sitting in the front seat got five stitches and the other one who was driving didn't take the treatment. We reported the accident to the Zoom car staff. We got the case settled in the police station by paying them, of course. We were all released from the hospital around 5 in the morning, relieved and thankful to God for our safe return to our homes. The thoughts of that night are terrifying, and it haunts me sometimes. I didn't get into a car for months, and rain scared me for many days when I saw it on the road. I thank God for giving me another chance for living this wonderful life and to be a part of this enormous world. I am willing to live this life in a more different way and take the chances that I didn't take in that life before the nightmares of the accident. After this accident I went on many trips and we stopped for one time at the spot of the accident and exhaled the trauma out together. It was just for the fear which was deep inside whenever I sat in the car or whenever a rainstorm arrived. It was basically all about feeling good and getting rid of the fear and terrible thoughts of that night. We drive safely now and nothing has happened since, not a scratch after that night. And I would like to share one more thing which is a little bit shocking. In one of the many trips we got the same red color van which was with us the night on 2am drenched with water and blood. Nobody noticed except for one friend who told us the next day and showed the car number of plates. We were surprised, and there was a silence with a smile on everybody's face. Experiences come from bad experiences. Never stop living and grow through what you go through. Lyle Thomas McCann was born near Red Deer, Alberta on August 24, 1931, as part of a large family of Scottish descent. He met his wife Marie in Torrington in the early 1950s, and the couple married just a few years later, eventually moving to St. Albert in 1964, where they lived ever since. 
Lyle was employed for most of his life as a long-haul truck driver, making journeys all over Canada and the United States to support Marie and their three children. On the 3rd of July, 2010, Lyle and Marie McCann left their St. Albert home for a vacation they'd been planning, a road trip to be exact. They planned to pick up one of their daughters on the 10th of that month when she landed at the Abbotsford International Airport. On the day of their departure, they were spotted by witnesses at a superstore gas station, filling up the tank of their 1999 Gulfstream motorhome with a green Hyundai Tucson attached via a trailer. It is then believed that the couple drove down the Yellowhead Highway on their way to the airport. However, on the evening of July 5th, Canadian firefighters received a call from a member of the public informing them that a motorhome was on fire at the Minnow Lake campground just outside of town in Edson, Alberta. Emergency services rushed to the scene, putting out the fire and searching frantically for any injured victims. No bodies were found, but investigators made a chilling discovery. The motorhome had belonged to Lyle and Marie McCann. Yet strangely, in addition to no bodies being found inside the home, the couple's green Hyundai was missing. Initially, hopes of finding the couple were high, but once the Royal Canadian Mounted Police visited the McCanns' home and found no one present, hopes began to dwindle. The McCanns had planned to pick up their daughter, Trudy, from Abbotsford International on the 10th of July, but when the McCanns failed to arrive at the planned date and time, their daughter, Trudy Holder, began to worry. It wasn't like her parents to be late, and if they were, it went without saying that they'd have notified her in advance. She tried to call her father, Lyle, on a cell phone she'd purchased for the couple to keep in touch, but the phone was turned off. Finally, when it was clear that something was horribly wrong, Trudy notified the Mounties, who immediately released a nationwide missing persons notification. The Mounties soon made the connection between the burned-out motorhome and the McCann's disappearance and quickly launched search parties consisting of ground and air elements. On July 16th, a full 11 days after their initial disappearance, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police located the McCann's green Hyundai near Highway 16 and Range Road 144, about 18 miles near east of Edson, Alberta. It was clear that the couple's disappearance involved an element of foul play, and it was decided that, although distressing, this new information should be released to the public in the hopes of witnesses coming forward. Around the same time, the Mounties announced they had a person of interest who was wanted for questioning with regards to the McCann's disappearance. 38-year-old Travis Edward Vader, of no fixed address, had multiple outstanding warrants at the time the couple went missing, as well as a considerable criminal history. Vader had previously been convicted of vehicle theft, possessions of break-in tools and weapons charges as early as 1995, with his latest conviction being that of unauthorized possession of a firearm in June 2010. A few days later, on July 19th, Travis Vader was stopped by police near Knighton Junction in Alberta, where he was arrested on outstanding warrants that were unrelated to the disturbance of the McCanns. On July 27th, Travis's sister, Bobby Jo Vader, told the media that her brother had stayed with her family in Edmonton on July 4th, a day after the McCanns were last seen, and that he appeared tired, sick, and that he needed to rest. Whilst Vader was being held in custody of the Canadian police, it was officially announced that he was the main suspect in the disappearance of the elderly couple. Police began searching a property south of Nojack, Alberta that was supposedly Vader's last known residence. They were incredibly thorough, going as far as deploying a dive team to comb through a nearby pond, as well as being given the unenviable job of searching the property's septic tank for any human remains. But still, the search teams found nothing. Yet despite this, Vader was still in police custody almost a year after the initial disappearance, as police believed he still had information regarding the McCanns, or at least had some involvement with them that he was keeping to himself. On July 27, 2011, a full year after the McCanns seemingly dropped off the face of the earth, a Canadian court issued an order declaring them to be legally deceased. 
The official theory within the Royal Canadian Mounted Police was that the couple had been killed and their bodies hidden on the very same day they departed for their vacation. Yet, despite no official charges, the previously released suspect, Travis Vader, remained the most likely to have murdered the McCanns. Finally, in April of 2012, despite still having never found their bodies, police officially charged Vader with two counts of first-degree murder relating to the deaths of Lyle and Marie McCann. However, in October of the same year, Vader was still not being taken to trial for the murders and was instead convicted of offenses that included drug trafficking, theft, and weapons charges. It seemed that the Canadian police simply wanted to keep Vader in custody and convict him of anything they could manage. This was probably born out of fears that Vader would simply flee the country if released, but this obviously represented a clear miscarriage of justice. If Vader could not be directly convicted of the murders, it was extremely morally corrupt to try to imprison him via some kind of legal backdoor. This is duly noted by Vader's defense attorney, who encouraged him to file a lawsuit against the RCMP, accusing them of keeping him in custody until he could be charged with the deaths of the McCanns. This forced the Canadian police's hand. A trial was thrown together, but it didn't go their way. On October 8, 2014, Travis Edward Vader was found not guilty of all nine charges unrelated to the disappearance of the McCanns and released from custody shortly afterwards. Upon his release, Vader told the media that the RCMP had probably destroyed my life. They put me in jail for four years to investigate me when there was nothing there to begin with, and that he knew nothing about the McCanns and that his heart goes out to them. It appeared that Vader was an innocent man. But on December 19th, 2014, despite there still being no signs of the McCann's bodies, Vader was arrested in St. Albert yet again in relation to the deaths of the McCanns. On September 15th, 2016, Travis Vader was found not guilty of first-degree murder. He was, however, found guilty of second-degree murder. The verdict attracted immediate criticism from legal experts, who claimed that it relied on a law that had been previously ruled unconstitutional. Not only that, but how can there be a murder conviction first or second degree when absolutely no human remains had been found? On October 31, 2016, Justice Thomas reversed the original conviction, and Vader was convicted of manslaughter. At his sentencing just a few months later, Vader received a single term of life in prison, with the eligibility of parole in seven years. But the question remains, was Travis Vader actually guilty of the McCann's murders, or did the Canadian state simply scapegoat a quirky but overall innocent man just to satisfy the public's need for justice? Until their bodies are located, this question might never be fully answered. These days, more and more young people are going traveling. Whether it be gap years from higher education or simply a break from the 9 to 5 grind, people are packing up their belongings into lightweight backpacks and setting off to tour Southeast Asia, namely Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Many of these travelers end up in Australia, given that it's much easier to find employment in an English-speaking country. One of these young people was named Peter Falconio. Peter Falconio hailed from West Yorkshire in the United Kingdom, but attended Brighton University with his girlfriend, Joanna Lees. After the graduation, instead of settling down and getting full-time employment, the couple decided to travel the world. So on the 15th of November in the year 2000, the couple embarked on a trip to Nepal, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Cambodia, and Australia. By the 16th of January 2001, the couple had arrived in Sydney on a working holiday visa. They worked hard for five long months, saving their earnings while they planned a comprehensive tour of the Australian coast. On the 25th of June, they departed on the road trip that would supposedly see them visiting Sydney, Canberra, Melbourne, Adelaide, and Brisbane. On the night of Saturday, the 14th of July 2001, Falconio and Lees were driving their orange camper van along the Stewart Highway in northern Australia, 
bound for the Devil's Marbles, a wildlife conservation area. Falcanio was driving with his girlfriend Joanna sat next to him in the passenger seat. The two had been aware that a car that had been following them since they stopped at a roadhouse in Barrow Creek and were expecting to be overtaken. However, when the white Toyota four-wheel drive drew alongside, the driver made frenzied gestures for them to pull over immediately. Concerned, Falcanio stopped the van and went to speak with the man, who had pulled off the road ahead of them. The stranger explained that he had seen sparks shooting out of the van's exhaust and was worried they might be seconds away from some kind of vehicle disaster. The pair of men went to the rear of the orange camper to investigate, but Joanna Lees remained suspicious of the strange man and moved over the driver's seat should the couple need to leave in a hurry. That's when she heard a loud bang coming from the rear of the van. She turned, but only saw the stranger man standing at the driver's window, a large revolver in his hand. Terrified, not knowing what else to do, Joanne Lees unlocked the doors and allowed the strange man inside their car, where he promptly tied her hands behind her back with the black cable ties that he produced from his pocket. It was horribly obvious that the man had been planning this the entire time. Lees was paralyzed with fear for a few minutes, but when the man tried to bind her feet and gag her to keep her quiet, she knew there was no turning back from that. She kicked and screamed, wailed and cried, until the man finally gave up trying to restrain her completely and began dragging her back to his Toyota. Lees knew that if this man got her back to wherever he was planning on taking her, it would mean the end of her life. She would be beaten, tortured, and potentially violated. Adrenaline kicked in when Lee saw the man's dog barking at her savagely from the backseat of his vehicle. When the man went to retrieve her boyfriend's lifeless body, she ran into the bush in an attempt to escape. The man searched for her before leaving, passing nearby three times, but she hid before finally flagging down a passing vehicle at 12.35 a.m., who took her back to Barrow Creek. Lees and her rescuer contacted Alice Springs Police at around 1.30 a.m. that same night, who arrived to collect evidence and testimonies at 4.20 a.m. The following morning, they commenced a search for the missing Falconio, the vehicle, as well as the gunman. When police returned to the scene of the murder and attempted kidnapping, they found a dirt-covered blood pool and the couple's camper van almost a hundred meters off the road, hidden among the scrubland. It was not until eight hours after the rescue that roadblocks were put in place on the twelve likely roads exiting the district. Police searches of the area in the following months revealed nothing but Lee's footprints, and although four indigenous aboriginal trackers arrived from a nearby settlement within a few days, not one of them could find evidence of Falconio or his attacker. Given the lack of an actual corpse, it took the police some days to appreciate the severity of the crime but the media were quick to sensationalize Lee's story as one of survival against all odds in an unusually cruel and brutal crime. A reward of 250000 Australian dollars was posted. Police were desperate for new leads given that the only new evidence in the Falconio case was an unidentified male DNA trace on Lee's t-shirt and some related DNA on the cable ties and camper van's gear stick. Police were hopeful that the release of the CCTV footage would lead to the person shown coming forward to remove themselves from suspicion. When this did not happen, investigators began to focus on the registered owners of the Toyota Land Cruiser identified, and on the 36 men whom callers had identified in the footage. Based on these results, police interviewed a man by the name of Bradley John Murdoch, Although Lee's description did not immediately connect Murdoch to the case and no DNA sample was collected from him, the investigating task force uncovered one of Murdoch's dark secrets when they arrested his apparent drug-dealing accomplice, who apparently seemed to know a lot more about the attempted kidnapping and murder than he had any right to. Police then visited Bradley Murdoch's brother and compared DNA samples taken from him to those found at the crime scene. Their findings supported the theory that Murdoch was indeed the perpetrator. But then something happened that the police were not expecting at all. Bradley Murdoch simply disappeared. 
there were no sightings of him up until August of 2002, a full year after Peter Falcano's murder. It just so happened that he was identified by police in South Australia, then arrested on completely unrelated kidnap and assault charges. It seemed Murdoch had a history of violence. The trial began on the 17th of October 2005 at the Supreme Court of the Northern Territory in Darwin. Murdoch pleaded not guilty to charges of murdering Falcanio and assaulting and attempting to kidnap Lees. However, Lees had identified Murdoch from police photographs shown to her in November of 2002 and finally face to face during the trial on the 18th of October. Murdoch was found to have left Alice Springs at a time and in a direction that could have led to him being at or around Barrow Creek at the time of the murder. Expert testimony presented at the trial indicated that Murdoch was the man captured in the CCTV footage at the service station at 12.38 a.m. The police found traces of his DNA on a pair of homemade handcuffs that Murdoch had used in the attack. This combined with the DNA match on Lee's t-shirt, allowed Murdoch to be charged with the murder. The t-shirt DNA was found to be 50 quadrillion times more likely to belong to Murdoch than anyone else. Murdoch was found guilty by a jury in a unanimous verdict, and he was sentenced to life imprisonment with a non-parole period of 28 years. He was also convicted of other assault-related charges on Lee's. Only after the sentencing was it revealed that Murdoch had previously been charged and acquitted of aggravated assault on a mother and daughter in South Australia some years earlier. It seems that it really is impossible for a leopard to change its spots. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located on both Spotify and Apple Podcasts. All links down below. Thanks so much, friends, and thanks for coming to my TED Talk.